Mr. Mercer, how are you? Good to see you, my friend. I'm good. Uh, listen, I'm excited about this. I, I, have, <laughs> I have stats. I want to play a game with you. <laughs> okay, let's go. For those that don't know, David Mercer is the uh, founder, CEO of LMAX Group. LMAX Group owns LMAX Digital along with a ton of other uh, foreign currency exchanges. Uh, I would argue, I can say this, I don't think you can. You guys are the largest or one of the largest uh, infrastructure providers or market makers or market sure. providers in foreign currencies. Uh, you also happen to be quite popular um, in the uh, crypto world as well. Not popular enough. No retail, <laughs> all institutions. Correct. All right. So I like that you guys put these together. I, I basically, I don't pay attention to any of the stats that LMAX Digital's Twitter account tweets all month. And I wait for the monthly report. Uh -oh. and, I, and I go through and I look at it. And in the month of March, mm -hmm. you guys did $20 billion in total notional volume on, you were 74 trades away, 174 trades away from 3 million trades yeah. in the month. And- you traded an equivalent of 482,000 Bitcoin. And this year alone already, year to date, you've done $66 billion. These are like bonkers numbers compared to most other exchanges. But it's been a slow year though, compared to sort of last year. You know, we need Q121, right? So our best month ever, we did 60 billion. We call a billion a yard in FX, right? So um, <laughs> sort of 60 yards is where we want to get to, you know? So 20 yards for me is kind of disappointing, but you know, you can't uh, change the market, I guess. It's been a sort of slow start to the year. Why do you think that it's been a slower start? Is it just price related? Is it macro like Fed policy interest rate stuff? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, as well as I do, if you're looking at it, it's kind of been directionless most of the year. Okay, we got sold off a bit. Everyone's worried about the macro side inflation of course you've got the uh, war in ukraine so and bitcoin particularly at the moment i mean that look the whole asset class is driven by bitcoin <sighs> we like to think that it's going to be a store of value asset we like to think it's going to be you know digital gold everyone talks about it but actually it's a risk on off asset class so like stocks if you chart the s p or the nasdaq versus say bitcoin you're just seeing the same price action just a bit of a lag so that's meant it's been directionless. I think now, um, you know, Dokon buying a, a whole bunch of Bitcoin has helped. Well, look, from the start of the year to now, we're basically unch, right? Mm -hmm. So it's whatever, whatever it is now, 46,000, especially unchanged in the year. We're still waiting for that influx of real institutional money because that's going to make it pop. If Doquan uh, from Terra with only $3 billion, I say only, but in the institutional world, it's not really that much money. If he can have the impact that he's had yeah. over the last, I don't know, five weeks or whatever it's been, yeah. when institutions show up with real size, does Bitcoin go to a million dollars a coin? You're going to be happy. I'm not even sure you're going to be doing this podcast anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> you're like, David, it's been nice knowing you, but I'm on a beach. What, what, do, you, what do you think happens though? Like, It's going to explode. Anthony, I mean, look, so here, here's the, I've said it again, I think before on your show, there are $200 trillion of assets in custody today. That's a fact. The three biggest custodians in the world are the three, you know, three, three biggest custodian banks are, you know, uh, State Street, Bank of New York Mellon, JP Morgan, they control a hundred trillion. There are 500 institutions in the world that matter. Total market cap of crypto today, 2 trillion. 1% of those assets in custody. I know all these names are looking to enter the market. I know all their customers and their investors want access to crypto. So if just 5% of those assets in custody go into crypto, it's very simple. The market cap of the asset class has to be $10 trillion. That's 5x we are today. So what happens to the price? You know, as I say, and you uh, get the keys and lock the door here. <laughs> I mean, I completely agree, obviously. <laughs> uh, what I think is fascinating, uh, I was talking to a, a pretty large hedge fund manager recently, and uh, his perspective on crypto was like, I'm not anti-crypto. Mm -hmm. I just know what I'm good at and where mm -hmm. I have an advantage, and that's in equities, and so I'm going to stick to investing in equities. Um, but it's interesting to me. Help me understand. And he knew that there was 21 million Bitcoin. He understood the idea of supply demand, obviously. When I started 
to explain the on-chain metrics and the ability to see the illiquidity in the market, he kind of, you know, he perked up a little bit, yeah. right? And he started to say, so you basically have like the structural liquidity, but then you have like the actual market liquidity and you can start to basically uh, analyze which people have what historical holding versus selling patterns, how much illiquidity, how long, when did they buy, what was the problem? And I was like, it's all right down the blockchain. Yeah. And you could just see him being like, I'm still an equity guy. <laughs> yeah. But like, there's more information available mm -hmm. here that could better inform various decisions. And so when I see, when I take that as kind of an anecdotal uh, point from a conversation, in your guys' metrics, uh, you break out the average trade size by instrument. And, yeah. and the chart that I'm looking at uh, has Bitcoin USD versus ETH USD. Bitcoin USD, uh, pretty much since the beginning of last year, has had a much more significant average trade size. Mm -hmm. So that strips away how many institutions, that strips away how much volume. It's just looking at when somebody trades, what's the average yeah. size? Why is Bitcoin so much larger? Is it because the market's larger and people feel like there's more liquidity or is there something else going on? There? 100%. I mean, that's that's where the liquidity is. I mean, if you, you know, you, you meet a bunch of people asking you, hey, what should I buy? And you'll know a lot more coins and a lot more assets than I will. But I'm like, look, if you're dipping your toe in the water, go Bitcoin. It's the most liquid asset class. So someone comes to us and they want to buy 10 bucks worth of Bitcoin, $10 million worth. That's relatively easy to do. You try and hit that in one clip in, in Ether and you're going to move the market and you're mm -hmm. going to get slipped 180, 200 basis points. You've got to slice and dice it. You're doing smaller sizes. It's just that all the biggest market makers are trading Bitcoin first. And again, let's look at it. It's 40 to 50% of the value of the total asset class. So when they first come, they're making Bitcoin. I think Ethereum's doing better. Solana's also doing better, but it's very thin. And when you talk about that institutional money coming in, you just see huge price gaps, which isn't good for the asset class. And it's partly what we have to try and do at LMAX Group and LMAX Digital is bring bigger, better institutional market makers to get deeper liquidity across the asset. I have a customer, you know, last week, literally bidding me up. David, look at this slippage. You know, all I did was buy 20 Ether, 20 million Ether. I'm like, dude, this is huge. You're just the biggest in the market today in that asset class. You need to cut that up. You need to trade that in shapes of about $50,000 if you're lucky to get it done. He can't do it in one click. He trades a bunch of foreign exchange with me. His biggest day in FX with me was $3 billion. And he trades in clips of 20, 30, 50 million. And they expect to be able to do the same in crypto. You just can't today. So let's use this hypothetical person or real person, but don't say their name. Um, if they trade $3 billion in a day mm -hmm. and they're doing it, let's just call it 50 million mm -hmm. uh, at a pop. Are they trading to capture one two percent moves intraday and they're like like literally day trading uh is it a human driving that is this all uh, uh kind of high frequency stuff like walk me through what they would do in the fx world if you trade three billion in a day and you're trading that size what, what is the goal or the trading strategy well it depends who they are right so i kind of have three distinct sets of clients you've got banks who are basically facilitating trades for their customers. Their customers might be asset managers, portfolio managers. They need to buy 100 million euros, 200 million euros, a billion euros to facilitate uh, rebalancing their portfolio. You've then got brokers, a lot of broker servicing retail, and they're just back to backing that flow. And then you've got the proprietary trading firms. They don't like the terminology HFT, high frequency traders, but they're just looking to gain some alpha and get in and out. They're trying to make markets everywhere and they're trying to nick half the spread. But the one thing that underlies all of that, if that's too detailed, too complex for everyone, is the smartest guys are all using the algos to execute the trades now. So even, you know, who's the most famous investor in Bitcoin? I guess it's Michael Saylor. You know, he's using an algo to work that order. He's got a target price. He's using a VWAP. And by the way, you can buy these on uh, eBay, right? You can buy these models if you want to. You just plug them in and you're just trying to, to 
to have a target price, right, to let you access that. So that's really what they're all doing. And no one's pointing and clicking. Um, so I'd say at the Today, 90% of all our FX volume are done through API and done through algorithmic trading. So when that person comes to crypto, yeah. they want to do similar size, I'm yeah. assuming. Uh, if you can't do $50 million at a time, then you can't do $3 billion a day. Correct. And regardless of how superior your infrastructure or technology is, it's a market dynamic issue. Yeah. But- if you need it, it's there. So remember, I've got the biggest institutional market makers on the street. Mm -hmm. So my biggest ever day in crypto, May last year, we did $6.5 billion in crypto. Biggest How much customer. money do you make on that? Like if you do 6.5 billion. did all right. Yeah, but like, like what does that look like just directionally? Look, I'm the guy, I'm, for, for us, or for, for the customer. For us, we're the guy in the middle, right? So it's a couple of basis points you're making just for every trade. The retail guys are gonna recoil in horror. Geez, we're paying 50 basis points or 10 basis points. No, I mean, the institutional game, you're charging one or two basis points. By the way, in foreign exchange, you're paying a 40th of a basis point to make it clear. That's the cost really? of trade FX, yeah. Why is it so cheap? Just because gas commodities. <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I'm glad crypto came along. No, look, you know, it's, it's, it's a very liquid, very efficient market. Again, to scale that for yourself and your listeners, foreign exchange trades $7 trillion dollars every single day, seven trillion. Mm -hmm. What do we think the spot market in crypto is a day? 20, 30 billion? So, you know, you're talking 200 X. So one basis point, if I'm good at math, is $6 million. If that's the biggest day- in I wish it was, six million. Is that what it is? No, 600. 600 K, is that? Oh right. yeah, one percent yeah. six million. Yeah. Yeah. See, look, I, we don't do public math. <laughs> we, we, we already did. Uh, but like, my, my my question is, how do other institutional exchanges that don't have the FX business, how do they build a business if they're only doing half a million dollars? Let's call it plus or minus in their biggest days. Well, you look. I mean, just look at their go to their it's uh, be retail. go to their web page and say fees, and it says 10, 20, 30 basis points. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I'm saying, I'm calling this out right now and saying it's too expensive to trade crypto today mm -hmm. if you're a retailer, if you're small. But I understand why it's that price, mm -hmm. right? Because it is hard to access it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what we do for a living is all about providing market access, about providing frictionless market access to any market we offer. That means the price point can come down. You know that well-known name in equities, is it's free to trade. Right, so the price has, has gone to zero. In crypto, it's hard to access it. It's hard to get the liquidity. In some cases on the retail exchanges, they pay liquidity providers. And also if someone's trading in size of, you know, 500 bucks, like really dollars and cents, you have to have a minimum there. So that's, what, that's why they can charge that. But I think over time, you're gonna see the price curve just look like this. It's just gonna, just gonna go down and it's gonna, resemble more what you see in equities and more what you see in foreign exchange. Do you think that we'll eventually race to zero, similar to what happened in equities in crypto for retail traders? Yeah, look, so there's a secret out here, out there, which is it's never for free. There's always a spread, yeah. right? So a lot of guys go, hey, I trade for free. Okay, what's the buy price? What's the sell price? But for sure, as the market becomes more efficient, and that's partly what we have to do at LMAX, I've got to bring bigger institutions to this marketplace. I've got to bring better liquidity to this marketplace. When that happens, spreads will compress. And when that happens, the cost to buy and sell will also compress. So yeah, you're going to see it become much more efficient and a better market for private investors and institutional investors alike. What have you heard from those institutions as to why a lot of them aren't in the market yet? Yeah, look, it's, it's tough for them, right? So again, it's... Um, it's market structure, right? Those institutions, those 500 names that really matter, they need a regulatory framework. What do I mean? They need regulatory determinism, okay? These are the rules of the game. This is how I access the market. And this is how I don't contravene any legislation. At the moment, with a lack of legislation, a lack of regulation, they run the risk 
that there's no determinism. And suddenly, two years down the line, someone says, hold on a second, you contravened this rule. Wait, that rule wasn't there. So that's the biggest blocker. Um, look, a bit, bit self-promoting here, but we launched, uh, announced that we're going to launch Futures with Six Group. Why did we do that? We can offer crypto futures on an FCA-regulated MTF. What's an MTF? It's like a swap execution facility in the US, and that can go through a central clearinghouse with Six Group. Now, the biggest banks, the biggest traders in the street understand that framework. So we give them a framework, we give them a ballpark that they understand, and hopefully we give them a pragmatic regulatory framework that allows this asset class to grow. And believe you me, this is important for everyone. Crypto evangelists, crypto natives, retail investors, that framework's important for everyone. So that's, that's the biggest blocker today. When you think about um, the largest institutions that are participating, how many of them are doing it because they're a founder or they're uh, individual at the head of the organization? likes it or uh, owns a lot personally versus uh, their clients, their, their pension funds, their sovereign wealth funds, their foundations are the ones pushing them to do it. So it's the former. And it wouldn't even be, look, I, I know you're on, on stage tomorrow with a, a famous founder who likes it. Um, but when I look at the don't, market don't makers- call, Don't call him famous. Well, let's, 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 <laughs> let me cut him down, then we'll build them back. Oh, I saw the guy on Billions, trust me, he's famous. <laughs> um, mostly it's because they can make the call. Look, to a certain extent, if you look at LMAX Group, I'm the largest shareholder of LMAX Group. 2017, we first looked at crypto, said, hey, should we do this? I didn't have to go through a lengthy compliance committee, risk committee, board, meeting to say, should we do it? We just sat around a table one day and said, let's launch LMAX Digital. So I think the preeminent market makers, the preeminent traders today are guys who had that lack of bureaucracy and were able to make slightly autocratic decisions. So I think that's why they were first. Imagine if you were in one of the largest banks, I've said this to you before, but one of them told me, they're gonna trade it this year. I know they'll trade it, one of the biggest banks in the world but they've been through 26 committee approvals so far. I think they've got 30 more to go. It feels <laughs> like uh, the other thing that's happening is the individuals are becoming institutions. We, we were talking uh, before the show, there's a, uh, a gentleman who started a hedge fund three years ago. Um, he put an enormous amount of money for an individual, nine figures, personally in the fund to get it started. Mm -hmm. He's probably the biggest LP, right? He's bigger than all the institutions are in the fund. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like as the currency gets devalued, asset prices go up, rich get richer, you now are getting in this weird world where like individuals are becoming institutions. And I think that like, they're the ones who transition first. We've already seen number of family offices, all those folks all come into it. I think what becomes fascinating is like they talk to their friends who aren't big enough to be institutions, but work at the institutions. And that's how it spreads. It's mm -hmm. less about the Bitcoin community convincing them. And it's more about, I'm watching my friends sit here and just pick up, you know, profits over and over and over again with yeah. the volatility of, you know, Bitcoin or crypto markets. Eventually I'm saying to my colleagues at work, we got to get in this game. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a, a an envy thing, a, a, a competition thing than it is like, we have some big macro perspective on, you know, interest rates and that's what's going to lead us to Bitcoin. Like, I, I think that we forget like the human psychology of this is like, my friend's making money. They're making more money than me. What are they trading? I'm good at trading. Like, I should go trade that too. If they can make that money, imagine how much I can make. And that's yeah. what pulls in these institutions. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. A lot of points in there, Anthony. I'll try and remember them. But uh, look, it is true. There's a lot of big names now in crypto who started as individuals. Maybe they started mining. They stuck together uh, an exchange or a platform really quickly. They launched a perp swap. They're now worth a lot of money. And that in itself is self-fulfilling. What I would say, stepping back again, you know, that capital markets is so much bigger than any given billionaire in crypto today, right? Back to that True. $200 trillion today. So what I'm looking at is five years hence, that efficient, market structure 
that will mean Bitcoin and crypto can overtake gold. Gold's 10 to $12 trillion today. And yet, guess what? Then, when you have deeper liquidity, a more efficient market, it'll be harder to make money. You'll have to actually yes. be a really good trader, right? <laughs> right now, you can just sort of, you know, put it all on red, put it all on black, yeah. right? If you're a believer, it'll become harder, but it'll become much bigger. And by the way, this is the natural evolution of things. You know, I'm old enough to remember dot com. Not everyone got it right. Not everyone backed Skype. Not everyone backed Amazon or Google. But it's important that some of that intellectual capital move from traditional Correct. markets into the new one. And that's happening today. And I think it's a great thing for crypto. And guess what? I also think it's great for traditional finance mm -hmm. because some of that's going to feed back into traditional finance and make that a better market as well. Russia, Ukraine is another topic that I know uh, probably is having an impact on your business. What, what's going on there? Uh, obviously, when you have some sort of conflict, commodity prices, currencies, it, it, the whole kind of macro engine yeah. starts to move. What, what have you seen both in the uh, non-crypto and the crypto part of your business? So I think yeah, first and foremost, the hardest bit has been the humanitarian impact. I mean, this is a human catastrophe. catastrophe. And people say, oh, we've dealt three conflicts before. We haven't. This is war in Europe, right? This is war with a nuclear superpower that is interwoven throughout the fabric of society, throughout the fabric of capital markets. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got Russians and Ukrainians sitting in my tech team, on my desk. Every institution does. This is tough to deal with. But, but, we're in capital markets, okay? So our job is to deliver efficient capital markets at all time. Credit crises, banking crises, pandemic, the atrocity of war, you need to have efficient capital markets, right? Goods still need to be paid for. So that's what we're trying to do now. So let's park the humanitarian bit for a moment. Crypto has had a great period. Mm -hmm. Why? Again, you've seen the robustness and the resilience of this asset class. Mm -hmm. We discussed the price action. This is really positive. We've seen that crypto can be used for good, mm -hmm. right? Frictionless, borderless payments again. You know, mm -hmm. people wanting to contribute all over the world in crypto to that. Guess what? We've, had, we've it's spurred the regulators into action. Mm -hmm. You know, it's no fluke that suddenly President Biden issues an executive order that Senator Warren tables a sanctions bill. The ECB, European Central Bank, the Bank of England suddenly accelerate their crypto frameworks. That was good. And probably the, the last thing is it debunked the myths. Everyone told me, hey, and look at it. Look what happened in the US. Crypto is going to be a sanction buster. Incorrect. You knew, you knew this. I knew this. How can they circumvent the sanctions? Let's look at it. AML guidelines worked well. It's quite hard to buy stuff with even Bitcoin today. I've never tried to buy munitions or tanks, right? Or, or jets, but I'm guessing that's pretty tough. And it's probably easier with a suitcase of dollars than it is Bitcoin. Oh, guess what, everyone? Bitcoin and crypto is pretty transparent. Mm -hmm. Have a look at the blockchain. And lastly, President Putin didn't believe in it. Why didn't he believe in it? He couldn't control it. So he spent no time developing crypto. So I think those myths have been completely debunked. So overall, it's been a very positive period. Again, like the start of the pandemic, right? A positive period for crypto and for this asset class. Yeah. Joe, John, what questions you guys got? I'm curious to talk about, so Bitcoin specifically, a lot of these institutions are rumored to want to get access to it. What about Ethereum and Solana? Are you seeing demand for those as well? Sure. But look, ultimately it comes down to liquid asset classes. You know, I'm in foreign exchange. Um, Euro dollar is the, the biggest traded asset class, um, biggest traded instrument. So any given day, Euro dollar is going to make up 30% of all the FX trading. That's just it. So Bitcoin today is going to make up 40, 50%. So Solana, yes. It's coming. Ethereum, yes, it's coming. 
but the most liquidity still gravitates to um, to the number one in that asset class. So it's up, I'd say, to the the founders, the engineers behind the other coins. You got to keep proving that point, right? The argument is, oh. Bitcoin for payments, Ethereum for utility. Okay, well, you've got to start showing us the utility. And the same with Solana, right? If you want that to trade more, if you want that price to go up, if you want to have more liquidity, you've got to keep proving the utility of those coins. Gotcha. And you don't think Bitcoin has to prove that? I think it's proven. For me, I, you know, the more you look at it, the more you research it, Bitcoin's proven. Well, it's been around, what, 13, 14 years now? I don't know how long Satoshi thought about it before he created it. It's proven and it's been through the peaks and troughs. You know, you know I said it, I've said it before. Look at, the, you know, March 21, was it March 20, the, the start of the pandemic. Every asset class got sold off. Oil traded below zero. Bitcoin chart said it was going to zero. It didn't, right? It found a level and it bounced back. And it traded, what, 64,000 at the end of last year? Now trading 46,000. This is now a robust asset. So I don't think it's got anything, anything left to prove. And, um, you know, you're not seeing many level one protocol br breaches, right, with this asset. Yep. I'm, I'm as comfortable holding that as I am holding FANG stocks or holding gold in my portfolio. And I think that's why it will go from strength to strength. And the others still have a lot more to prove. Gotcha. When it comes to your business specifically, LMAX, mm -hmm. right? How do you guys think or project that crypto as a percentage of your business will look years from now? I'm assuming it's still a smaller part given your head start in FX and, and whatnot. Sure. But where do you think that this goes? Does it become a meaningful portion or, or just talk me through kind of your thought process there? It could become 50% of it. So why do I think that? So we trade over 100 instruments uh, in foreign currency. So we trade, you wouldn't believe it. I'm sure you never want to trade it. We trade Norwegian krona against, against Swedish krona. Who wants to trade that? Well, guess what the Scandinavians do, right? So, um, but at the moment, most things are against dollar, right? So the S&P is quoted in dollar, NASDAQ's quoted in the dollar, gold dollar, a little bit of gold euro, but actually 90% of it is gold dollar, dollar gold, sorry for any currency guys that are out there. Um, so what happens with crypto at the moment, it's you're trading Bitcoin dollar, Ethereum dollar. You're going to start trading Bitcoin S&P, Bitcoin gold, Bitcoin Swedish krona, Norwegian krona. We have it right now in the crypto space. Oh, it's Bitcoin dollar, David. You also have um, USDC. It's the same, guys. Don't worry about it. It's the same order book, right? So I can actually merge the dollar order book with the USDC order book. So I think it could become a lot Right now, first step, let's get past gold. Gold will be 5% of my book. Um, but I really think as we start to accept, certainly the currency-related or the currency-like cryptos, that's what I think Bitcoin is. I think you're going to see that traded against everything. We're launching an exchange in Singapore. First time ever within LMAX Group. We'll have an FX exchange and a crypto exchange on the same infrastructure under the same license, right? The, uh, our customers love that, right? One account, trade Bitcoin, trade Euro, trade gold, trade NASDAQ. How good is that going to be for the asset class again? And hopefully, of course, good for LMAX Group. Of course. You get one magic wish mm -hmm. in the institutional world for Bitcoin. You wave a magic wand, it happens. What's the thing you wish for? I want a regulatory framework um, in the United States and the United Kingdom tomorrow so that the biggest banks in the world can just go trade the spot and the future together. Because at the moment, banks can't really trade the spot. They want to trade the future and the derivative. Within Almax Group, they can trade the spot on Almax Digital and the future on Almax Exchange. So that's what I want to happen. And actually, I think it is happening, but pff, it takes time with these legislators, these regulators. Mm -hmm. You think it's that important? That's like the number one thing? The number one thing. If you want this market to grow, Anthony, we need regulatory determinism. Yeah. That's it. 
it's all very well. There's only so big this market can be built on retail and private investors. Correct. I'm very happy when they keep growing and they keep doing well and making more money. But you want that weight of money. I want those 500 institutions in the space. Correct. They just need to know the rules of the game. So let's get moving. Let's do it. And, you know, no apologies for this. Offshore regulation is not the way. Island regulation is not the way. We all have to do it to a certain extent while we're growing. We need the leaders. Yeah. You need the CFTC, the SEC, the Fed, the Bank of England, the FCA, the MAS in Singapore. You need these guys to create the framework, right? Because it's a pragmatic approach again. You want those pension funds and those asset managers to be able to access the market. Correct. When they access the market, this thing is just going to go pop, pop, pop. I ain't going to say nothing else after that <laughs> ending. <laughs> Where can we send people to find you on the internet or find out more about LMAX? It's pretty easy, right? LMAX.com or LMAXdigital.com. And I'm David.Mercer at either of those. We, we got uh, to get you tweeting more. Do you know? Yeah, I don't think people... Just not, much, not that much fun, am I? You know, I'm sort of, a, I'm sort of the status quo. I'm just a little bit, you know, where's the old gray head guy. Where's your cover photo from? <laughs> that one, that's the North Pole. So I've got a world record for the most Northern game of rugby uh, at the North Pole. So it's Glad always quite- I asked. <laughs> it's quite fun when you uh, speak to any Canadian, as I always say to them, I bet you I've been further north in your country uh, than you have. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, I've already you been, North Pole. I got two questions. How'd you get there? And what's the weather like up there? Oh, I nearly swore. Um, it's uh, bloody cold. But then again, the guys in Chicago kind of looked at me, looked at me like, yeah, it's not that cold. Yeah. You know, what was it, David? Minus 35, minus 40. Yeah, it's kind of like a normal day in February for us. Um, a whole bunch of planes from London. And then I trekked 130 miles, put in a sledge with uh, a bunch of buddies and... Um, hoping it would all be over very soon. You played the rugby game outside? Yeah. Oof. In shorts. <laughs> huh? That's how rugby hey, does it, John. Yeah, in yeah. shorts. My bad shorts. disrespect. Was that a requirement for the world record or you're just crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm from Belfast and all the, uh, all the English guys were like, you're Irish, you have to wear shorts. I'm like, yeah, hell, I'm wearing shorts. <laughs> and, uh, but we had to set up, it was quite interesting, right? We had to set up the, we had to set up the, the pitch. We had to put, Bags full of, of um, snow down so that the plane could land to bring the kit to set up the pitch. We had to put the posts up, draw the lines, the whole thing. Uh, one of my great marketing guys at the time, he brought a, brought a drone over to take, the, to take a video of the match. Your battery's frozen within a minute and a half, so <laughs> we didn't get much footage. <laughs> That's amazing. That Love is that. awesome. Now, now I got to think of something that we can go do that's not at the North. I hate the cold. I'm not going to go. I'll go, maybe I'll go somewhere. Where's the hottest place in the world? <laughs> you the Sahara. You don't want to do the South Pole? That's, my, that's, that's on my bucket list is to do the South Pole. Um, maybe go and play some rugby there and then I've ticked them both off. But the hot, you can do that my COO. He's from, he's from Africa. He likes, the, he likes the heat. I struggle with that. Nah. You, you heat is way better than cold. No, you you like like you know ninety degree weather. No, and no. you say that's hot. Nah, we're I was at one hundred and thirty degree weather. I was chilling. All right, <laughs> we're, we're we're good. Don't worry. The heat, the cold though, that's not my thing. Minus ten degrees and stuff like that. Well, it's bad enough. I mean, I, I played golf with a buddy of mine. Um, actually, he runs LMAX Exchange um, on the FX side in Scottsdale, Arizona. I went, hey, this is really cheap. The hotel, the golf is cheap. He goes, yeah, it's great. Summer. You love it. It was 120 degrees. I nearly, I nearly <laughs> spied on the second. <laughs> in, in Miami, what happens is uh, during the summer, we always go golfing because it's cheaper. It's no competition for tee times, anything. We're not good at golf, but it's fun, whatever. Uh, the second you start getting into the fall, you see the prices jump because like, yeah. well, it's getting cooler, right? So they know, like, all right, it's actually the inverse. Most places in the summer is more expensive. Here, it's the opposite because it's just yeah. hot as shit out. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> not, not Scottsdale is probably even worse than uh, than here. All right, my friend, thank you so much for doing this. We uh, we enjoyed it. Uh, I, I'm hoping for you that uh, sixty billion dollar months come back. Sixty that yards. Means, that means uh, yeah, sixty yards. There you go. That means uh, that's good for everyone. I come back and we do a hundred yards in any any given month. That's the goal. A hundred? Yeah. So a five X from here. Yeah. Yeah, by the end of the year. Book it's it. open. Book it.